This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcaster Orion Samuelson and yours truly, Max Armstrong, and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. Planting season is coming to a close, but the summer education season kicks off. Hello folks, welcome to This Week in Agribusiness. I'm Mike Pearson, behind the desk here on this Memorial Day weekend, but Max Armstrong is with us. In fact, he has a look at what's coming this summer from Farm Progress. Well, Memorial Day weekend, Mike, is a good time, I think, to check in with an old friend of ours, Willie Vogt, for a couple of reasons. Willie, for one thing, we get to this point of the year every year, and we pretty much now, these days, have the planting of the crops underway. What have you been hearing from out of the countryside? We know there's been tremendous progress. The job is done for many. There will be that job of replant, though, for some, won't it? Yeah, there will. And actually, I just came back from a very long drive out to the East Coast and up through um you know, Georgia and into Tennessee, and then also into Illinois, Southern Illinois and into Missouri. And I saw a lot of soggy fields. I saw some areas where there will be some replant, but I also saw some beautiful seedling corn out of the ground, some very um, consistent fields, some soybeans in, the wheat in Kentucky looked really good. So I think there's some, there's some good news. And as usual, it's spring. We know that there's going to be bad news with it. We just lined it up. I'll tell you what, though, I'd really rather replant with that GPS planter than the old days trying to line those rows up. Just saying. This year, one thing's going to be a little bit different. We'll quickly switch from planting season into what I call the learning season because the Farm Future Summit, as we've been sharing with folks, is coming up in just a few days. You'll be there, no doubt. Yes, I will be. As a matter of fact, I'll be up on stage a couple of times moderating some panels. I just found out one of the panels I'll be moderating. We'll have a, a friend of yours and mine. Bill Northey will be joining me on a panel. We'll be talking about soil health and carbon and some of those issues, along with some other panel members. Someone from Lando Lakes will be joining us too, but I was very excited to see Bill will be on the panel with me. Having gone to this event so many times through the years, when you visit with growers after the fact, what's the number one thing they'll tell you that they came away with? Uh, the thing that really benefited them the most? Well, you know, I think information is a big deal, but to me, the interesting thing is the comment I get, I picked up something in this session that I'm gonna use on my farm right away. Maybe it's an affirmation of an idea they've been thinking about and they just wanna put it to work, whether it's enterprise accounting or rethinking who, um, how my management structure, oh, um, that's come up. I think one of the things somebody told me one time is they, they figured out they really need to do standard operating procedure documents for their farm. And they had never thought about it the way we brought it up at the summit in one of the presentations. It's so nitty gritty into the way we run a farm business that this time you spend at the summit will pay for itself. There is also that opportunity to exchange ideas with each other that you get at a meeting like this. And, and this is a perfect forum, it strikes me, Willie, because something will be heard from one of the expert speakers. And then in the hallway, you'll have a couple of growers standing together saying, well, I tried this or I've thought about trying this. What's been your experience? You know, you hear exactly that kind of thing. the same. And it's the beauty of a live event, you know, and I'm excited about that. Obviously, we had one in 2020. It was one of the last live events I think anybody could attend. And we're excited to have one in 2021 in Iowa City. I think the interesting thing is that you meet somebody, maybe you've been to the summit before and there's somebody you've run into in a previous summit, or it's a whole new face you haven't met. And the other thing is when you're on site at the live event, you can kind of buttonhole one of the speakers and do a little one-on-one -on -one for your own farm because you're there. Now we do have a virtual version of this event and there will be some interaction on the platform we're using where people can exchange ideas, but frankly, nothing really beats being in the hallway. Well, in summary, the finance boot camp is first and then the uh, Farm Futures Business Summit follows the next two days, correct? Right, and the first day of that boot camp, and when we say boot camp, that is a good, solid day of digging into financials, taxes, accrual accounting, what you should be doing with the way you deal with depreciation. How is the tax policy in the Biden administration potentially affecting your business? All of that's going to be covered in that first day. Then on day two, we get into business management. We've got Dick Whitman there. Um, he's, a, he's a very in-depth uh, speaker on the very topic of how to run your business. He's got a new publication out that will offer tools for farmers to do a better job in running their business. You've got um, 
Darren Fry from Water Street, who's been a longtime columnist in Farm Futures, will be there. I'm excited because we're going to have somebody up on stage you and I both know well. Greg Solier is going to be there. And frankly, this June report he's going to give us will be valuable to get us to harvest, I think. The Finance Boot Camp is on the 15th of June. Farm Futures Summit the 16th and 17th. Coralville, Iowa. We'll see you there, Willie. I will be there. Well, they vote. And, oh, I understand, Mike, also that there is a discount. If you, down there, a promo code MAX, you get a 20% discount, dog. Got it? Hey, who, who said uh, you can't get a benefit by watching Max? All right. Well, thanks, Max and Willie. Folks, check that out, farmfuturesummit.com to get registered. And be sure to use that discount code MAX, M-A-X. And it's always education season here at This Week in Agribusiness. This week, it's time to dig into these markets. And we are joined by Garrett Toy of Ag Trader Talk. Garrett, volatility continues here in this corn market. We're up, we're down. To close the week, it looks like we're going to be moving a little bit higher. Where do we go from here in this old crop corn market, Garrett? Well, I've been kind of favorable to the old crop spreads here, old versus new. It's it's kind of a tug of war. We're getting to the transition period between old crop and new crop. Um, you know, technically it's it's the first of June. We've got a month until we're looking at first notice day on the July contracts. Uh, cash corn in July and August are obviously going to be interesting, but <clears throat> um, you know, the combination of the factors, we've had some inflationary buying from the money market crowd. You've got China in the market, um, trying to talk the market down, um, you know, and uh, I think that they're trying to manipulate the market here a little bit. I mean, you look at what they're trying to do, uh, all signs point that they need the corn, uh, but it's <clears throat> the amounts that they're buying is obviously on the, the radar of the government. And I, they've tried to crack down on, on commodity speculation, which I think if they need to buy corn, uh, they don't want speculators trying to, especially homegrown speculators trying to run the price up on them sort of thing. But um, yeah, that makes me a little bit nervous that it's on the radar of the government. But I think big picture, I mean, the fundamentals reign supreme. Um, you know, the volatility that you mentioned in the market is going to continue. Um, you know, we've had a uh, fund liquidation, the, infl the inflationary you know, trade is kind of cooled here a little yeah. bit. Um, it's still there. It's just, you've seen some profit taking. We're $1.50 off the highs. Um, you know, the question mark is, is can we go back and retest those levels? I think, you know, part of their issue, you know, is seasonalities. You know, we're into late May. You're going to have more seasonal pressures built into June. We have a quick planting pace in corn. We hit 90% planted this week. You know, things are looking pretty good, you know, uh, for the most part. Uh, except for maybe some dryness conditions in the Dakotas. Uh, I think that the farmer did, you know, sell some corn once they got done with planting and, and, and they uh, um, were happy with the way how, how planting went this spring. Yeah, it certainly seems to be the case. And now, as you mentioned, Garrett, we're seeing rain move across lots of the Corn Belt. It's, it's fits and starts, it's little shots, but for folks getting it, it's certainly beneficial. Garrett, in your part of the world, we're hearing a lot more about ethanol plants coming back online if they had closed down due to COVID or ramping up production. What have you heard from the, the ethanol end user side of the corn market? Yeah, the ethanol market's coming back. It's a uh, it's mixed bag. You've got some ethanol producers that have their coverage bought and are actually backing out of the market a little bit. You have two large ethanol producers um, that are in the center of the Duratio country that came back online. Um, we're back to pre-pandemic levels on ethanol output and gasoline demand this week. That's positive. So um, yeah, I mean the demand the demand structure for old crop corn is strong. Um, you know, China may have canceled a few handful of cargoes, or it more sounds like a transfer of ownership than a cancel, uh, uh, less than a million metric ton. But <clears throat> they, the, the, the Chinese export loadouts are there. Ethanol margins are fantastic. Uh, the old crop demand is there. It's just a question of who's got coverage and who doesn't have coverage. Absolutely. As far as moisture is concerned, like you mentioned, um, I think that's part of the reason we sold off is with the rains that came across the Corn Belt in here. But you look at the drought monitor, especially in our area locally, uh, we're just getting spoon fed moisture. I think the the, the S and Ds are tight enough that we're going to have some sort of weather scare. Um, whether we can go back and retest contract highs is a function of weather. I think that uh, some of these you know inflationary buyers who have taken profits come back to the table or not, and that's a sixty four thousand dollar question. But I think we do have you know. <clears throat> 
if if the weather pattern changes in here at some point, it wouldn't take much for this corn crop to go backwards, in my opinion. I think you're exactly right, and there is going to be some volatility remaining. We'll be back with Garrett Toy to dig into the other markets when we return. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by the Soybean Checkoff. Tips, videos, how-tos, and more. If it has to do with ag tech, you'll find it in the Tech Tool Shed, your unbiased, one-stop resource. And we're back talking markets with Garrett Toy of Ag Trader Talk. We discussed the corn market. Garrett, that obviously has a direct influence on the wheat market. And we've seen very, very dry weather across the Dakotas and the Canadian Prairie, but spring wheat isn't taking off like I would have expected it to. What's your read on that spring wheat market? Uh, I think the function of the market is still in anticipation of potential higher feed wheat. The market's, the market, <laughs> it's, a cross, it's, a, it's a crossing point. You've got the market trying to price in feed wheat versus corn, um, but then the higher quality wheat. So, I mean, you should, at some point, you should see, um, you know, hard red spring start to separate itself from KC and, and um, and uh, Chicago. Um, part of that may be the fact that we had some, you know, it's we've had some rains in Canada. Um, you know, the Dakotas are still very dry. Um, the the initial hard red uh, hard red spring uh, condition ratings uh, were the lowest that we've ever had. We've only had two other years where we've had conditions this low. Uh, ultimately, it's it's you know, the hard red spring acres number high print was was probably in March um, because with the conditions the way they are, I mean, I would suspect that we either have some sort of abandonment um, or you know, obviously yield issues. <clears throat> so, I mean, the question is, is um, you know, do they roll the dice? I mean, the, the commodity prices are too high to have big prevent plant numbers this year, uh, but I would suspect that some of that hard red spring uh, acres finds itself uh, in the form of corn here before uh, too long. Yeah, I, I certainly think you're right, at least talking to some of the growers I've spoken with. Now, Garrett, we've also got to talk about the soybean market. Again, the volatility is there just like it is in the corn market. Similar fundamentals developing. As you look out on the new crop side of this bean market, Garrett, the crushers have got to be excited given the demand for, for oil out there as you look to the future. Oil demand is massive. Um, we're buying in demand. <clears throat> We've had, what, three plants, uh, three new crush plants announced. We've had three or four new canola plants announced. Um, you know, the, the S&D is pretty tight. This, I think the, the thing that's lingering, the uncertainty over the market is, is how many acres did we, did we buy back from the March uh, 31st numbers. Um, again, the thing with old crop beans is, <clears throat> or the old crop is the transition from old to new. We're into a roll, crop, roll period here in the first part of June where they'll be rolling from the July to the November. Um, and there's a lot of length in the market that needs to move forward. We've seen, I, I think the crusher has decent ownership here near term. Um, we'll see what it looks like in 30 days. Um, but, you know, we've had bases, especially in the West where this biodiesel is, <clears throat> is the most prevalent. Uh, really start to back off but we after the may expiration the the, the soybean basis was so such a premium we're actually just kind of re reverting back to this late april basis levels um but i i just i think that the crushers have decent ownership exports um <laughs> we sold more beans this week i mean we need to see cancellations um you know i i, I we're we if we're going to get this 120 carry out that the usda says we're at i mean we need to I don't think we're doing the job as far as, um, you know, canceling the balance of these old crop bean commitments. Yeah, I, you know, those orders are staying in, some moving to new crop, but Garrett, it, there's phenomenal demand from our overseas buyers, predominantly China still at this point. Right. Yeah, and I'm a little surprised. New crop uh, bean commitments are they're about the fourth largest for this time of year. Um, and we're seasonally starting to get into the point where, um, you know, China will start coming to U.S. beans. Uh, it's interesting, the South American data, the crushers have a ton of bean ownership down there. Um, but their bean basis, FOB values are <clears throat> like 10, 20 under still, which is a sharp discount to U.S. values. So there's no real incentive for the crusher to move beans to export. They're going to crush them, and that's going to maybe hurt crush a little bit uh, competition because they're, they're going to be selling meal and oil uh, into our markets. All right. Things to watch out for as this year moves on. Garrett Toy from Ag Trader Talk. We appreciate you taking the time. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next. Brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. 
Every week, Chad shows us the kind of technology that farmers can utilize on their operations. But of course, we live in rural communities and fire departments, both volunteer and professional, are also great users of new technology. Chad has an update. I'm continued to be impressed by the amount of technology used in our local fire service. And on this week's tech segment, you're going to see a piece of technology it's real easy to understand the application. So part of the advancements in technology in the fire service have even gone to thermal imaging. Thermal imaging cameras have gotten a lot smaller, a lot lighter. Uh, in today's world, uh, we brought out the Bullard TXS. So this is the newest advancement in thermal imaging technology. It's a 1.6 pound camera. Uh, this camera is a one button on, one button off thermal imager. Uh, it's got a vanadium oxide detector on the inside with three, 320 by 240 resolution. So it's very high res. This works for not, uh, not only identifying fire and where victims are at in a house fire, but also we can use it for grain bin rescue. So if we go uh, to a silo type rescue, uh, we can see where people are at within that, uh, within that silo if we need to. We also use them for vehicle accidents uh, to identify if there was somebody maybe sitting in the vehicle or they were ejected into a field. And uh, we can also look for product and tank levels when we go for hazmat incidents. So the technology has been, been awesome today. And, uh, and you're going to see how small, how lightweight, and how easy to use with, with gloves on, which is pretty darn cool. Nick talked about the application of the thermal technology in grain entrapment. Seems like a lot of times farm safety is talked about after the fact. But recently there's been a movie done called Silo. And this movie does just that talks about the importance and understanding of grain entrapment. Shut it off! Shut it off! That's a million and a half pounds of corn in there. There's a lot of pressure on that kid's lung. Standard kid's procedure's gonna kill that kid! Bring my son back to me! For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thanks, Chad. It's great to see technology being put to use in rural America to keep farmers safe. Don't go anywhere. This Week in Agribusiness, we'll be back with more. Welcome back. It's time to get an update from the ground. What's happening in agriculture around the country to help us do that? We're checking in with the folks who know which are your local farm broadcasters. Joining us first is Dwayne Murley from KWMT in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Dwayne, Iowa was dry throughout the planting season. How are things looking now that the, most of the crops are in the ground? Hey, Mike, thank you for having me on this week. You're absolutely right. And over the last uh, probably two and a half weeks here in the Fort Dodge area, we've gotten a couple inches of rain. What we're kind of waiting for is the heat right now. And um, but yeah, I mean, things are really looking really good out there, Mike. And and with the rains that we have had since uh, the crops have been put in the ground, I, I think we're I mean, things are just really looking good right now. So, Dwayne, I mean, you mentioned you need the heat. I think that's true across the Corn Belt. How are stands looking as we're early in the growing season? I think stands are really looking good, not only in the in the corn, but also the soybeans, Mike. And one of the things I got to tell you that sticks out to me this year, no wet spots. I mean, there's no drowned out areas out there. I mean, I, a lot of it's probably because of the dryness we had um, going into the spring season. But, you know, everything's just it's just a carpet of green out there right now. Man, that is something else. But I tell you what is not always been a carpet of green for the past few weeks has been the markets. Dwayne, we've seen a lot of red in those screens yeah, here. Uh, what are you seeing exactly. in local basis there in West Central Iowa? Mike, I have to tell you, I cannot remember when our local elevators have been on a positive basis. I don't know that that's ever happened, and if it has, I can't remember it, but we're positive all around. Our local elevators are positive, our, our um, ethanol plants are positive, which isn't unusual for the ethanol plants, but to have the local elevators positive, I mean, it's it's been like this for probably the last four or five weeks, Mike. That is something else, because that is corn country. You've always got a surplus of corn in West Central Iowa see a positive basis certainly speaks to the availability of the grain. Dwayne, you out you talk to farmers every single day. What's their mindset here as we get ready to, to kind of move full force into summer? Are they excited? I think 
I think they are excited, Mike, and, and getting back to the positive basis a little bit, you know, there's the demand. We've got the, the poultry industry, the, the swine industry, the cattle industry so strong in this area. I mean, there's a demand for the grain right now, and I think that, you know, adds to the positivity that the uh, farmers are feeling right now as we head into the summer. Now, you mentioned you do have a lot of livestock producers. They've certainly felt a squeeze as these feed costs have continued to rise, Dwayne. Are, are they staying in business and looking to get through this rough patch? I think they're looking to get through it, but what I'm seeing too, Mike, I mean, some of these guys are, the dry lots are, are empty right now. They're not replenishing those. And, and I've talked to some of the producers too, that, you know, they're selling the calves and typically we sell the calves probably more of a premium in this area, probably in that six, seven, eight weight area at the sale barn. So, um, you know, I think we're seeing um, maybe some adjustments made there, especially in the cattle industry. Absolutely. It's going to be a long summer for a lot of folks. That's Dwayne Murley, KW. WMT Radio, Fort Dodge. Well, let's move a little farther west with our discussion and talk to Russell Nimitz of the Western Ag Network. Russell, you're out there, Montana, the Dakota areas. The headlines we keep seeing are dryness. How are things shaping up in your part of the world? Well, Mike, you hit the nail right on the head. The headline out here in Western Ag Network country is drought. And as farmers kind of wind their spring planting up, they haven't been able to drill into very moist soil at all. So, you know, time will tell, but uh, it's, it's dry as a bone out here in states like Montana, the Western Dakotas into Wyoming, and of course, Colorado. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I was up in Northeast Montana in that outlook in Plentywood, Montana country, and watching farmers there plant into some very dry soils with their world-class Durham and spring weed and of course pulses. So we'll wait and see, but we could certainly use a little bit of drink of water. And, and I, you know, I did even see a couple jackrabbits up there packing sack lunches because that's all they have to eat up there, Mike. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is bone dry. And Russell, you know, you mentioned Montana, the northern states produce a tremendous variety of, of row crops and, and other commodity prices, got crops, but also livestock. You're in cattle country up there, Russell. How are pastures looking? Well, I mean, stuck in a severe drought, I mean, pasture conditions are, are in pretty tough shape. You know, livestock producers, the ranchers, they're winding things down as far as branding. They're getting ready to move their cattle to summer pastures if they can find any. So we'll just have to wait and see. But unfortunately, if we don't get any moisture and we can't take those critters out to that summer pasture, we're going to start seeing more and more of those cow-calf pairs, those mama cows with calves outside being hauled to town and uh, being sold because, you know, cattlemen and cattlewomen, I mean, without any other option, they're left with that choice. You know, they are, and, and that's the decision that, that it comes down to. Russell, have you heard of any herd liquidations as of yet, or so far is it just a little more aggressive culling? Well, I think in some of our coverage area where it's a little bit worse, like Western North and South Dakota, we have heard of, of ranchers having to actually take a significant amount of, of cow-calf pairs to town and, and be sold and be sold to other cattlemen and women from somewhere else that has a little bit greener pasture, maybe better moisture conditions. Uh, so far, um, we haven't seen those type of significant numbers yet in places like Montana, but you know, as you work further south into Wyoming and Colorado and Utah, where unfortunately they're, they're facing some pretty tough drought conditions as well. I'm sure livestock producers are weighing their options as we speak. Well, thanks, Russell. That's Russell Nimitz from the Western Ag Network. And don't go away. When we come back, we'll be talking mental health to finish up the month of May with Adrian DeSutter. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Summer, of course, is a busy time for farmers, both in the field with their crops and at home with their family. Max had a chance to speak with Adrian and Drew DeSutter to finish up Mental Health Month. Yeah, Adrian DeSutter has been with us every weekend all month long. Mike, talking about mental health on the farm, and I asked her about balancing those farm matters that have to be attended to with the matters of family. We've been a part of some master farmer classes and, and um, kind of learning how to be, uh, you know, 
better farmers by through mentorship um, and we've learned a lot from them but but what we hear all the time is the whole idea that we have to as younger farmers make time for our family and that so often those that older generation is telling us we learn too late you know it was something that we um, you know we should have prioritized you know those those football games or those uh, the dance recitals or whatever it is you know we should have made time for that when we were younger so we're we're doing our best now to try and um, implement that as early as we can but also balance the the strenuousness of what needs to be done on the farm yeah you know it's an interesting point and it's easy for an older guy like myself to preach about this but you know at farm meetings where you're trying to improve your productivity and trying to improve your business it's stressed that you have 40 seasons that's all that's all you get with kids it's even fewer oh my gosh yeah no kidding it's it's something that uh <laughs> You, you learn, you have to figure out what you're going to prioritize. And I know I always hear that slogan, faith, family, farming, in that order. People always want to say that. But I think uh, it's another thing to really prove that and really show how you're prioritizing your faith in your, farm, in your family over your farming or, or in addition to your farming. So uh, it, it's a difficult balance. And I, and I think, uh, too, that you know, legacy of your kids is going to outlast the legacy of your farming operation. So you have to look, put that in perspective. You know, our farms are important, but our families are ultimately the most important aspect of our farming life. I saw a great tweet the other night. A guy said, oh, I could be out in the field. I need to be out in the field planting, but he was at the ball diamond. It reminded me, of course, of when I was a kid and my dad would be sitting over in the bleachers and I knew the storm clouds were on the horizon. Uh, these are important things, as you point out, uh, that will be remembered uh, many, many years down the road. Uh, uh, Drew, just, just communicating back and forth with somebody, maybe another friend outside of your spouse is important, isn't it? Somebody you can rely on and kind of bounce ideas off of that. That's helpful too, is it not? If you can find it, identify that friend and keep that friendship. Yeah. And you know, we have a lot of tools like our, our cell phones today to keep us in contact with a lot of different people. Uh, I'm fortunate I can still stay in contact with a lot of friends that I went to college with and a lot of them are in agriculture or farming in different parts of the state. And just to call and sometimes then about our farming operation or the weather in our area and get a different perspective. It's just really nice to have that. I also have some very close farming friends at home and a good Farm Bureau Young Leader group. And just to build those networks is just, it's huge to just be able to have, you know, a time where you're just able to talk and, and uh, maybe get some things off your chest that you can't really communicate with your with your family or don't feel like communicating with your family at the time. So what you're saying is that through the networking that a person gets through farm organizations, you're not just learning, you're not just deriving information, you're not just borrowing ideas from someone else. This is a support network that gets formed. And as I've seen with older farmers, they go back and tap this well many times over the years. There are friendships, sometimes many states away, that growers rely on because of a farm organization or maybe a, a peer group that was set up. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, funny you bring that up. Is Yesterday morning, I... I hadn't talked to this guy probably for two years, but he was in a soybean um, uh, leadership class with me, and he sent me a text, you know, how are things up your way? This is a crazy market right now. How's planting going along? And I hadn't talked to with him for two years, and he's from Oklahoma, and it was just kind of nice to text back and forth a few minutes and ask about each other's families and farming operations. And I met him through a, an ag organization, and, you know, we'll stay in contact probably for for life and the, the people are what's important about those organizations and just adds tremendous amount of value to your own operations and to have those connections is just very important to me and uh, very important to many farmers that have been able to experience that. We sure do thank Adrienne DeSutter for taking a little bit of her family time and making it our time here on This Week in Agribusiness. We'll revisit the subject, I'm sure, Mike. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Adrian and Drew. I think you're right, Max. Mental health is an issue we will be coming back to again and again because it impacts everyone. Now, agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier brings us his farm weather forecast for the nation for the week ahead. It's presented by Pivot Bio Proven, the nitrogen-producing microbes that stay put, whether or not. 
Well, it's time to talk weather. Greg, looking at your forecast over this next week, what are you seeing? Unfortunately, no significant improvement to dryness and drought conditions anywhere across the West. We continue to see some improvement, some limited into the Great Lakes region. Pretty quiet weather picture for outdoor work and field work anticipated early in the week. Things temporarily quieting down where we are beat up on severe weather rain, which was a benefit last week for the Canadian Prairie and areas of the Dakotas. And we do have some rain in the forecast for Washington State into Northern California. Typical mid to late distribution on the uh, rainfall for May that is there. Some uh, moisture into the Canadian Prairie, wind and warmth across the Dakotas. Opportunities to continue to move along the spring rains nicely coming off the recent rain, but still lots of drought issues going on across the Dakotas, across the West as well. Pretty quiet weather picture as you'd expect for mid to late May. No sign of the monsoon anytime across the southwestern part of the country. Slight cooling four corners as the showers and thunderstorms and additional drought improvement continue on from Nebraska southward through Oklahoma and Texas. A little ridging up aloft, so there's heat into play over the four corners back in the valleys of California. That's triple digit stuff here mid to late portions of the week. Again, last week organized rain, cold, snow, some frost and freeze. Things quiet down up here. Moisture back into areas of the Dakotas, south route through Kansas and the areas of Nebraska that were hit with severe weather last week. We'll keep an eye on that and the showers and thunderstorms into the eastern Corn Belt. Mid to late portions of the week, especially Great Lakes areas, will be of great uh, benefit there. Here's the typical heat and humidity set up for Oklahoma and Texas with additional showers and thunderstorms. Those could trend heavy and severe through the Delta region back into sunshine and dry time later in the week for the mid to late portions of the week. You expect readings uh, pretty much close to seasonal norms and you'll get that through Kansas and Oklahoma. While into the Corn Belt areas, northern and eastern areas early in the week, here's the Mississippi weather system expected to make its way to the north and east. Cool high pressure across the northeast of New England. Showers and thunderstorms organized over much of the Midwest. They'll spread into the drought areas of the Great Lakes region. Mid to late portions of the week with a couple of downpours as well. So some localized drought improvement anticipated there. Meanwhile, weather system continues to bring some drenching rain down through parts of Florida back to the Gulf Coast areas with high pressure across the Carolinas later in the week. Showers and thunderstorms, heat and humidity build back across much of the southeastern portions of the country, easing some of the dryness already developing again across parts of the Mid-Atlantic region. Oh, Greg Sohe is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country. Presented by Pivot Bio Proven. Visit pivotbio.com to find a representative near you. Well, we're talking weather, and when we talk weather right now, we got to be talking drought, Greg yes. Solier. Are you seeing an improvement in this next week's forecast? Uh, much like last week, we had some improvement, not an ending, but improvement across the Canadian Prairie, much of the northern and western Corn Belt, the drier areas here. As the week wears on, some additional moisture, and we anticipate some drought improvement in this part of the country. Look at the downpours of an inch or two, western Corn Belt, eastern plains, the severe weather aspect. Last week was here, this week from Texas into the Ohio Valley. Couple of spots, see some scattered. Uh, maybe quarter to half inch of the Pacific Northwest. Nothing for California. How about that second week of June? Greg is going to start to heat up? Uh, yeah, but nothing out of control here. Temperatures a few degrees above average, including the valleys of California, up towards the Canadian Prairie. Good news there with soil temperatures in mind. Much of the Corn Belt into the northeastern uh, New England. A bit below average, but comfortable from an outdoor work standpoint. Southern Plains, Gulf Coast areas in through Florida, where the wet weather is uh, certainly occurring down through this part of the country. Some downpours, Ohio Valley up towards the Sioux and Point side of the east from there. Some uh, good coverage anticipated. The dry time continues from about the divide on westward. Now that third week takes us up to the official start of summer. Greg, what are you seeing? Feeling like summertime, but not out of control. No excessive livestock stress. A little above average for the valleys of California up near the Canadian border. Northern Lakes region, the northeast of New England, still a bit below average in this part of the country. Much of the country, plain states into the central and southern Corn Belt about normal. Same with precip in this corridor from Minnesota to the Mississippi and points southward above average here, including the northern and eastern Corn Belt. Look at the expanding below average moisture across the plains and southwestern part of the country. Now, Greg, our final week takes us to almost the end of June. What do uh, you see? Uh, temperatures, I think, are manageable here, running from uh, the valleys of California up towards the Sioux, the Canadian Prairie. Readings otherwise normal for the eastern Corn Belt. Texas, a bit below average over the southeastern part of the country here. Uh, for moisture, look at the expanding below average and probably with time and an emergence of uh, dryness and drought in the west with above average moisture in the eastern sections of the country. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. It's a tractor that changed hands, but it never got out of the family of Ferguson in Indiana. 
Max's Tractor Shed is brought to you by Store Lock Tool Cabinets. You owe it to yourself to see what they have to offer. It is a remarkable quality that they bring to you. Storelock.com is their website. Well, this tractor, after it came out of the plant in Michigan, wound up on a farm eventually in Indiana, but it went to Illinois first. It stopped at a dealership at Hoopston, Illinois, where Kenneth Thompson was the dealer. It was brand new when he got it. He sold it to his nephew, Russell Thompson, along with the field cultivator. That field cultivator is still with the tractor, and it's owned by Russell Thompson's daughter, Denise Emmond. But I can tell you that her son, Todd, likes that tractor a lot, too. A 1950 Ferguson T020 in White County, Indiana. Mark Stock comes in now to fill us in on what's happening at Big Iron Auctions. Mark? Well, folks, we hope everybody has a very happy and safe Memorial weekend. And when you come back from the holiday, check out the 800 items selling in 22 different states on BigIron.com. Jesse Respass is from Plymouth, North Carolina. They've got a Massey Ferguson 8150 mechanical front tractor. They've got a Case IH 635 Module Express six row cotton picker. Also, Stretsky Farms is from Julesburg, Colorado. They've got a Case IH 7230 combine selling on BigIron.com. Fram Brothers Partnership from Gretna, Nebraska. They've got a John Deere 35G compact excavator. It's only got 334 hours. They've also got a Polaris Ranger 4x4 side by side. Haley Equipment from Carroll, Iowa has got a Case IH MXM 190 mechanical front tractor. They have a New Holland TS110 mechanical front tractor as well, plus a New Holland BR780A round baler and a Case 850B track loader selling. Kobe Peebles is from Cleaver, Missouri. They've got a John Deere 4710 mechanical front tractor. Ralph Harcum is from Hebron, Maryland. They've got a 2006 Hewley 6300 triaxle manure spreader. And Reggie Owens is from West Monroe, Louisiana. They've got a Case IH 8940 mechanical front tractor. All this equipment Max sells on the June 2nd Big Iron online auction. The FFA Chapter Tribute is sponsored by Nationwide, the number one farm insurer in the country. To register your FFA Chapter, go to NationwideSupportsFFA.com. That's NationwideSupportsFFA.com. Nationwide, we stand for you. This Week in Agribusiness is proud to continue our salute to FFA as we meet officer teams from around the country. We've been getting to know the state of Michigan's officer team, and this week we're talking to Stephanie Harvey. She served for the past year as the state reporter. Stephanie, what got you involved in FFA? Yes, yeah, so my FFA career started uh, my sophomore year of high school when I kind of transitioned from 4-H to FFA, um, which happened through my livestock judging team. And since then, I've been a huge part of FFA and 4-H. I never really gave up on the 4-H aspect of my life, but that definitely changed my world. That's fantastic to see involvement in both organizations. Stephanie, what was it that made you wanted to get into leadership at FFA? Leadership just kind of came naturally to me. Um, I just took every single thing and opportunity that they gave me and it did it to my fullest extent. And I realized throughout those processes that leadership was something that I loved and I loved being able to have conversations with people, which I believe is a true aspect of being a leader. Absolutely, but this past year, Stephanie, ha Stephanie, having those conversations has been difficult with coronavirus. What was it like this past year? Yeah, it was difficult and different than what we expected when we ran and were elected but I wouldn't change it for the world because just because I wasn't able to see those members in person, I was still able to see the impact I was having and have those conversations just over a Zoom platform instead. It is, it is an adjustment, but it was one that I think everybody has made well. Stephanie, as you go forward, you're looking to go to Oklahoma State University for political science and agricultural communications. Is that right? That is correct. I'm really excited to become a cowboy and head to Oklahoma. Fantastic. Well, we wish you the best. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Stephanie Harvey, Michigan FFA state reporter. Now, Samuelson says insight and commentary from Orion Samuelson. Since becoming a farm broadcaster more than 60 years ago, one of the questions frequently asked by people who listen and watch is why did you go from farming to talking about farming? Simple answer. 
talking about farming is a lot easier than doing it. Although I found out after getting into this in industry that I couldn't sleep in in the morning because most of the time I was getting up earlier to do my early morning broadcast than the listeners who were with me on TV and radio. But as we look at this year so far, there's a word that I'm having to use that I really don't like, and that word is drought. Many parts of the country are short on rainfall, and not going into the crop year with a good supply of moisture in a lot of those fields. But I'm afraid we'll have to talk about it, but like we always say, we can talk about weather, but we can't do anything about it. And then let me repeat what I said a week ago. Farm bill writing time is quickly approaching. Take a look at what you would like to see in the farm bill or the farm and consumer bill, and then let your congressman know so that as they write the bill and the language of the bill, you'll get some of what you want. I've been talking about the qualities of ethanol for decades, and we did get a pretty good report this week on what ethanol means to the environment and to clean air. That's just one of the subjects that will be talked about. Those are some of my thoughts. Thanks for your questions on Samuelson Says. It's Memorial Day weekend, which means we take time to reflect on those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for America. And a lot of folks do that by showing their pride with an American flag. Yeah, this is a weekend, Mike, when many folks put out their flag to display old glory. But you know as well as I do, on farms and ranches across the United States, there's a display of the flag every day of the year, from the top of the barn, from the silo, from the grain leg, the planter, the combine, the tractor. So I wasn't surprised at all when dozens and dozens of folks responded the other day when I said, show me your farm flag.
Well, we hardly scratched the surface there of all of the flags that were sent in to us. But Mike, this is interesting. I received three photographs of the American flag flying on farms in other countries, in Australia, Canada, and in Belgium. And one of the farmers commented, hey friend, we know what you have there. We appreciate your friendship and what your country has done for ours. Thank you, Max. That is some beautiful scenery. And from all of us here at This Week in Agribusiness, we want to say thank you to those that have served and to the families of those who have lost loved ones. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.